Why can't we have a Spider-Man ride in Disney World? When are you allowed to bring a horse into the parks? And what liquid layer rules does Disney want you to abide by? Do we even want to know? We're exposing the weirdest, most bizarre rules across Disney World today here on DFB Guide and going to tell you how they're going to affect your trip. Hey everybody, it's AJ for Disney Food Blog. Now, I'm not here to be a party pooper, but we've got some Disney World rules to cover today to make sure you're staying informed and out of trouble. Good thing these rules are really bizarre and interesting to learn about because we still want to make this video fun, and it will be. Our first rules that we're going to talk about are the things that Mickey Mouse can't do with you. Right. So Mickey Mouse can sail ships. He can fight towering dragons and shoot fireworks out of his fingers. So is there really anything Mickey can't do? Well, from a rules perspective, yes. Mickey Mouse likes to meet his friends in several different places around Disney World to take pictures and sign autographs and give big old Mickey hugs. And while each Mickey Mouse interaction is going to be completely unique, there are some rules that Mick, as well as his fellow Disney pals, have to abide by to keep themselves safe and to keep you safe. For example, Mickey Mouse cannot... I repeat, cannot sign anything on your body. No ankle signatures, no wrist signatures, no forehead signatures, nothing. But if you're wanting Mickey's signature somewhere besides just an autograph book, you might want to bring something else that you'll use and see more often when you're back home, like a shirt or a water bottle or a white picture mat frame or a hat. Mickey is also not allowed to hold your baby. I know, it sounds like a cute photo op, but it is another important rule put in place for your child's safety. That being said, if a kiddo wants a hug, Mickey can give hugs, which make for some super adorable photo ops too. Now, you may have the perfect picture pose in mind, but let Mickey guide you through the picture posing process. Mickey's not really allowed to take pose suggestions in order to protect himself from accidentally doing anything inappropriate, so no Charlie's Angels with the big cheese, okay? And let's do one more before we move on. Mickey can't give you a gift. The intentions might be nice. You might have purchased a toy that your kid's been wanting for a while now, or you got a piece of important jewelry picked out for your girlfriend, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, but don't ask Mickey to deliver these gifts for you. Even if you're bringing your own gift for Mickey to give, Mickey still needs to create magic for all guests. And if a little one nearby sees Mickey hand a different little one a pair of ears or a Mickey Mouse plushie, it might seem pretty unfair if they go up to Mickey and don't get a gift from him as well. So avoid the awkward shutdown and don't try to get Mickey on board with your special gift reveal. It'll mean much more coming from you directly anyways. Okay, what's the deal here? Disney California Adventure in Anaheim can have a whole Avengers campus, but Disney World can't? That doesn't seem fair. Well, there are reasons you're not going to see any Web Slingers ride or Captain America meet and greet in Disney's Orlando parks, and it's not because Disney doesn't want to. The reason they can't have more of a Marvel presence in Disney World has to do with Universal Orlando. Before Disney purchased Marvel in 2009, Marvel Comics had already signed a contract with MCA Incorporated, the company that owned the Universal Studios theme parks at the time. Even after Disney purchased Marvel, the company did not get all of Marvel's licensing rights. The original Universal Universal contract states that other companies, including Disney, cannot use any Marvel characters being currently used in a Universal theme park east of the Mississippi River. In other words, Disney World is legally not allowed to bring certain Marvel characters to Disney World because Islands of Adventure has them in their park right now. And as long as Universal continues to pay Marvel, aka now Disney, for the use of those characters, that agreement is permanent. That being said, since this contract clearly states that it only applies to parks east of the Mississippi River, Disney California California Adventure at Disneyland Resort is allowed to have an entire land devoted to Marvel characters, complete with the Web Slingers attraction, multiple meet and greet experiences, and a whole new Marvel coaster on its way to the park in the future. Well, we think it's a coaster, but that's not confirmed. <laughs> Wait, hold up. How then did Disney World have the ability to add Guardians of the Galaxy to Epcot? Did it break the rules? Nope. Actually, Universal Orlando wasn't using any of those characters in its theme parks, and as the contract states, Disney World can't use any Marvel characters that are currently being used in Islands of Adventure. So Star-Lord, Rocket, and Friends were all free game. 
So what about other characters not being used at Universal Orlando? What about Ms. Marvel, She-Hulk, Moon Knight, and Captain Marvel? Could they potentially get their own rides at Disney World? Well, they haven't as of yet, and the whole licensing situation with Universal is complicated. The answer might technically be yes, but Disney hasn't announced any plans to bring any of those types of characters east of the Mississippi yet. So for now, don't expect to see a huge Marvel presence in Disney World. It's unlikely the situation with Universal will change anytime soon, so if you want the full Disney and Marvel experience, you're going to need to head west, not east. Disney World has managed its way around the original Universal agreement just a tad by bringing Marvel to Disney Springs, which is technically not a theme park, but a shopping and dining district. So you might see some Marvel themed treats at some of the dining spots as well as see a store entirely devoted to Marvel merchandise at superhero headquarters here. However, don't expect to see Marvel characters turn up to meet and greet with guests. Another loophole? Disney Cruise Line, specifically right now the Disney Dream, also has Marvel Day at Sea specialty cruises. And I know that's not Disney World specific, but it is interesting since these cruises have home ports in Fort Lauderdale, which is definitely east of the Mississippi River. I guess since the event doesn't technically kick off until the ship's in international waters, it's all free game? I don't know. Technicalities always make my brain hurt, but Disney may have found another loophole here. So how strict is Disney when it comes to taking snacks into its attractions? Honestly, less strict than you might think. When it comes to the rides, you're not allowed to take food and drink onto a ride directly because it'd be awfully hard to hold onto a Mickey pretzel while also holding on for dear life in the dark around Space Mountain. But for many ride queues, you are allowed to bring food and drink into the line with you to have something to drink or munch on while you wait. You'll just need to make sure you finish your item before you get on the ride or throw it away in one of the trash cans inside the queue. As far as Disney World shows go, many of them will also allow you to bring snacks and drinks with you. This mainly goes for shows in outdoor theaters like Indiana Jones, Epic Stunt Spectacular, Spectacular, Beauty and the Beast Live on Stage, and Fantasmic, all inside Hollywood Studios. When it comes to indoor theaters, however, you're more than likely going to need to finish up your treats before you head into the show. However, the Enchanted Tiki Room over in Magic Kingdom is one of the few exceptions. So if you want to buy a Dole Whip and enjoy it in the AC, Tiki Room is going to let you do that. But the real challenge there is getting to the Tiki Room before your Dole Whip melts, or before you eat it up, whichever comes first. Okay, let's talk no-fly zones. Aerial shots and recordings might be cool to watch online, but you aren't allowed to capture these kinds of videos yourself when you're inside the Disney World parks. Specifically speaking, no drones allowed. As it turns out, the airspace over Disney World is a no-fly zone. This means nothing is allowed to fly in Disney from the surface up to 3,000 feet above the ground, unless said flying device has special permission to do so. Not to mention, drones operated by guests would majorly take away from the experience for others. I mean, can you imagine how unsettling it'd be if you were walking around Fantasyland and you suddenly look up to see not birds flying overhead, but dozens of drones? It'd very much feel like an invasion of privacy, and it'd really be breaking the magic for you, too. That being said, there are some drones that are getting ready to grace the Disney scene, but not for recording purposes, for show purposes. Over on the west side of Disney Springs this summer, you're going to be able to catch the Disney Dreams in Flight drone show in the evenings, which will be completely inspired by Disney stories showcasing flight. This show begins on May 24th and will last until September 2nd. So if you're visiting the area this summer, make sure to schedule in some Disney Springs time to check this one out. So not all Disney rules are a list of don't do this and don't do that. Some rules are actually in place to say yes to certain things, like mini horses. Anyone else immediately think of Lil Sebastian from Parks and Rec? You're forever the MVP in our hearts, Lil Sebastian, forever and always. So while service dogs are more of a common sighting throughout the parks, they're not the only service animal allowed to join families during their Disney World vacation. According to Disney, miniature horse service animals get the green light of approval as well. Disney's official statement on service animals reads, At Walt Disney World Resort, a service animal is a dog or miniature horse that is trained to do work or perform tasks for and to assist an individual with a disability. So yeah, if you require a service animal to help you get through your park day and only if you're required required a service animal, then you can walk your mini horse down the middle of Main Street, USA. Keep in mind that with any service animal, there are certain areas and attractions in the park that are still off limits. Like most rides, for instance. No way you're getting a mini horse on Big Thunder Mountain Railroad with you. Can you imagine? Be sure to talk to a cast member at the front of the attraction if you're planning on getting in line for a ride. They'll either offer you a rider switch option or have accommodations in place for your service animal to hang out in the meantime. 
Also, keep in mind that you will have to let your service mini horse or dog relieve itself while you're in the parks, but Disney does provide a detailed list of locations where this is permitted over on their website. As for everyone else who doesn't have a dog or horse buddy service animal tagging along with them during the day, please, please, please remember that these animals are on duty and aren't strictly pets. So even if it's really cool to see a little Sebastian trotting about, it's not okay to go up to the service animal and pet them because it can throw off their groove and be potentially dangerous for their owner who's relying on them to have a safe and fun day inside the parks. So planning a pool day at your Disney World Resort is fantastic. Those pools are nice, but they also have rules. And if you don't follow these rules, your relaxing day by the water could be cut short. Rule number one, no food and drink are allowed in the pool. Notice how I said in and not near. You're more than welcome to kick back in a lounge chair and enjoy a Mai Tai that you picked up from the nearby pool bar. Just don't attempt to take that drink into the pool with you if you're ready to take a dip. Rule number two, swim diapers are required for kids in diapers. This rule is for safety and sanitation purposes, and we're going to expand on that later in the video. I know you're probably on the edge of your seat now. And rule number three, you can't pool hop, usually. So if you're a guest at a Disney World resort, then you can only use the pools at that hotel. So if you're staying at the Contemporary, for instance, you can't ride on the monorail over and use the feature pool at Polynesian Village Resort. You're going to be denied access at the pool gate. That being said, there are a few exceptions to this pool hopping rule. If you're staying at Port Orleans French Quarter, you're welcome to spend time lounging by the Dubloon Lagoon Pool, but you're also welcome to visit Port Orleans Riverside, where you're going to find Old Man Island, which is home to a large pool, a spa, a kiddie pool, a wading pool, and a short but fun water slide. And vice versa, if you're staying at Port Orleans Riverside, but you want to experience that 51-foot sea serpent water slide over in Dubloon Lagoon, French Quarter is going to welcome you on over. If you have an upcoming trip planned for any of the three all-star resorts in Disney World, you're in luck. No matter which all-star resort you might be staying in, sports, music, or movies, you can visit any of the all-star pools. Yep, any of them. At All-Star Music, there are the Calypso and Piano Pools, All-Star Movies has Fantasia and Duck Pond Pools, and at All-Star Sports, you'll find the Surfboard Bay and Grand Slam Pools. Now, folks who stay at Disney's Yacht and Beach Club Resorts have their choice of pools at both of these resorts, too. For those looking for some leisurely hangs, you can check out the Tidal, Admiral, and Dunes Cove Pools, but the best pool at Yacht and Beach Club, and quite possibly all of Disney World, is, of course, Stormalong Bay. It features a sand bottom pool, a pirate ship slide, a lazy river, so you might want to plan more than one day to check out this one. Now, warning, 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 you gotta say it with me. In 2025, Stormalong Bay will be closing for an extended refurb between January and May. Yes, I'm gonna tell you about this every single time I can because I don't want anyone to show up there during those five months and be incredibly upset that they're spending that much money to not get access to Disney World's best pool. So if this is a high priority experience for you, you're either gonna wanna book your trip before the closure or after the refurb finishes up. Now, there are a few more rules Rules you'll need to follow to make sure you're having a safe and fun day by the pool, but you'll be able to find those rules listed right outside the pool itself, as well as over on the Disney World website. Now, pool rules part two, water park edition. We are branching out of the Disney Resort pool rules and hitting up water park rules next, which may start impacting you during the future Disney World vacations way more than they ever did before. Why? Because starting in 2025, those staying at Disney Resorts, including Disney Vacation Club properties, will get a free park ticket to enter the water parks on their arrival day. You'll be able to use this perk at either Blizzard Beach Water Park or Typhoon Lagoon Water Park, whichever's open at the time, but only on your check-in day, so don't overlook that important detail and miss out on this big perk entirely. Okay, now that you know why these rules might impact you more soon, let's dive into them. An ironic statement for sure, since one of the water park rules just so happens to be no diving in the lazy river, so let that be rule number one for you. Rule number two, know the dress code rules. According to the Disney website, swimwear with buckles, rivets, zippers, or exposed metal is not allowed in the water parks. Along the same lines, you're also not allowed to wear jeans or wetsuits on select attractions, all for safety reasons. Once again, if your kiddo's still in diapers, make sure they're wearing a swim diaper or plastic pants inside the pool areas. And while you can wear water shoes around the park and on most attractions, cast members will let you know if you need to remove your shoes for any particular reason. And trust me on this, you're going to want to wear some sort of swim shoes around these parks because those pathways can be torturous on bare feet. You won't notice it for a little while and then all of a sudden it'll sneak up on you. Rule number three, know the snack rules. Much like the Disney theme parks and Disney 
Disney Resort pools, you're more than welcome to bring your own snacks to the water parks too, just as long as you follow the Disney snacks from home rules, i.e. don't bring them into the pools, don't bring them in glass containers, and make sure your snack isn't ultra pungent or alcoholic. And here's something neat for you to consider. You can also pack your own drinks and snacks inside a small cooler to bring into the water parks with you. You can do that at the parks as well. Just make sure those coolers aren't carrying anything glass or alcoholic, or any loose ice either, because those little cubes can be dangerously slippery apparently, even on a hot summer's day. Now, what better time to visit the Disney parks than during an important milestone worth celebrating? Disney loves to celebrate your family's big events along with you, from birthdays to graduations to anniversaries to bachelorette parties to teachers who survived yet another school year. Shout out to the teachers out there, y'all rock. And while Disney's chill with you bringing gifts to your family members while you're inside the parks, they're not chill with you bringing in wrapped gifts. Unfortunately, even if your gift is wrapped up super cute with a nice big bow on top, security members at the front of the park will need you to unwrap your gift so they can inspect the contents inside and make sure it's safe for you to bring into the park. So all that hard wrapping work on your end will be for nothing. So if you are bringing a gift for a special someone in your family or friend group, plan to bring it in a gift bag that security can easily inspect. Ah, uh, yes, we've finally come to that time in the video where we need to discuss the diarrhea rule. It's the one you were on the edge of your seat to learn about, remember? Now, while our reporters were out and about at Epcot one day, they strolled over to the Liquid Layer Splash Pad, which is a small area in the park right between Mission Space and Test Track that's got some misters to keep you cool on hot days and a splash pad for kids to play around in. Seems innocent enough, right? But right by the splash pad, we found the liquid layer rules that made us think about things a little too much. The second to last rule on that list reminds guests to, and I quote, not use the fountains if you are ill with diarrhea. And then that gave us all a mental image that we just want to scrub out of our minds, but instead decided to share with you. You're welcome. Now, in all seriousness, we're not trying to gross you out, though that might be a natural result of us bringing this up in the first place. It's just a good reminder that if you are sick on your Disney World vacation, we want to strongly urge you to stay isolated in in your room in case it's something that can be contagious to other people. And please, especially don't get in any bodies of water that other people swim in or interact with because nope, nope, not going to go there. You know why you shouldn't. I don't need to go into the details. Now, while getting sick before or during your Disney World trip is awful, been there, experienced that, don't wish it upon any of you. It's important to try your best to not spread germs to other folks around the parks just to try to tough it out. That doesn't help anyone, and it certainly doesn't help you get better faster. If you find yourself sick on your trip and don't feel well enough to leave your hotel room for a doctor's visit, remember that you can do a virtual visit via Advent Health. That's the official health partner of Disney World, and the doctor's visit thing, the virtual visit thing, is kind of new, so you may not have experienced that yet at Disney World. Now, you can find more details through the My Disney Experience app. They have like a whole Advent Health section. But if you're in need of a tummy soother, the Disney Resort gift shops do have over-the-counter medications that you can purchase immediately, which yes, are a little pricier than you'll find in the drugstores outside Disney property, but maybe worth it in the case of an emergency. So cast members have a lot of different rules they need to follow while they're on the clock. Many of those rules have to do with helping guests make their days in the park extra magical or helping to avoid the magic being broken entirely. And then there are the rules that keep everyone safe, including the cast members themselves. During Disney's rainy days, which happen quite frequently, cast members have a specific protocol they've got to adhere to. For the most part, attractions won't close because of a few sprinkles here or there. However, if the rain gets super heavy or if there's thunder or lightning in the area, then Disney's leaders and coordinators will call for a Weather 101. Normally, a Code 101 for cast members means that something isn't working or that an attraction is closed. So a Weather 101 at an outdoor attraction means that a ride is shut down due to storms and cast members manning the ride need to take cover. Now, when it comes to indoor attractions, on the other hand, the ride probably isn't going to close during a Weather 101, but the cast members working outdoor positions of said indoor ride must take cover if there's extremely heavy rain or thunder or lightning in the area. At an indoor attraction, like Haunted Mansion, for instance, that means that Lightning Lane cast members and greeters and the person holding the end of line sign need to be underneath some sort of shelter until the storms pass. So here's where this rule can get a bit tense. As a cast member, you have to take cover if the leaders call for a Weather 101. However, cast members also have to make sure that guests aren't huddling under shelter that could potentially block the ride queue or the entrance or easily bottlenecked pathway. So there are times that a cast member might be standing under a shelter, like an umbrella near a ride's entrance, for example, to prevent getting drenched, which is 
what their rule is, but they're also going to have to tell other guests that they can't take shelter in the same place. Yep, that can get kind of awkward and feel hypocritical at first if you don't realize why the cast member is sending you away from their personal shelter spot. But I promise you, it's not for selfish reasons, it's for safety reasons and they have to do it. In most cases, cast members won't send you back out in the storm without giving you an alternative solution to staying dry. More often than not, they'll point you in the direction of the nearest gift shop or indoor quick service or another indoor section entirely where you can hide out that doesn't cause a safety concern for guests and cast members. To help cast members out, make sure you're packing your park bags with the weather in mind. In your park bag, have portable umbrellas and ponchos and potentially a change of clothes at the ready so you can brave the storm even if you're suddenly caught out in it for a spell. All right, to all my Dr. Pepper fans out there, you are not going to like this Disney rule. There is no Dr. Pepper sold in the Disney World parks or resorts, not one carbonated drop of it. Now, that's not because Disney has anything against the soda. You're still more than welcome to bring your own bottles with you if you want to. Disney's just staying true to a partnership that Walt Disney himself set up years and years and years ago. Disney's partnership with Coca-Cola was established by Walt Disney back when Disneyland first opened. Now, while Disneyland did have two sponsored drink providers at the time of its opening, Coca-Cola and PepsiCo. The domestic Disney parks have been strictly a Coca-Cola hub since the 1980s. That means you're not going to find other soda providers sold in the parks, including that beloved soda with the 23 different flavors, Dr. P, since it's owned by the Dr. Pepper Snapple Group and not by Coca-Cola. You won't even find Dr. Pepper at the McDonald's on property. Trust us, we've tried. But you know where you will find Dr. Pepper hiding out for sale inside the Disney bubble? over at the Swan and Dolphin Hotels. It's true, we found Dr. Pepper for sale by the bottle over at Fuel, a grab-and-go quick service on the Dolphin side of the resort. Even though these hotels are on Disney World property, they're actually owned and run by Marriott, meaning they can sell Dr. Pepper if they want to sell Dr. Pepper, and Disney can't do anything to stop them. It's also worth mentioning that if you have a car, or if you use a rideshare service like Uber or Lyft, you can always venture outside the Disney bubble to a nearby fast food shop or grocery store if you want to, since there are plenty of places in Orlando that'll still give you that Dr. Pepper goodness. And if you're willing to accept Mr. Pib or Pib Extra as a substitute for Dr. Pepper, there are some places where you can find that alternative DP version too. I know, that's going to be blasphemous for you DP purists out there. I'm just saying, if you're desperate for something similar tasting, Coca-Cola does own Mr. Pib, so you can find it in a few places around property, like at the Coca-Cola Rooftop Beverage Bar in Disney Springs, the Speedway Gas Station just outside Magic Kingdom, and Yak and Yeti in Animal Kingdom. Some hotel marketplaces or gift shops will also have Mr. Pib sold by the bottle. Again, if you're willing to make an exception, just this once. Now, Disney pin trading isn't just a hobby. It's a treasure hunt where you can trade your own Disney authentic pins for even better Disney authentic pins or just ones that fit your collection better. But before you go on this treasure hunt for the first time, or even for the first time in a long time, you're going to need to familiarize yourself with the ground pin trading rules. First things first, there are two ways that you can potentially trade with cast members around the parks, resorts, and shops, either from a pin board that a cast member's got stationed nearby or by a pin lanyard that a cast member will wear around their neck. No matter which type of trading method you come across, make sure to always ask a cast member politely for a pin instead of immediately grabbing for one. You're more than welcome to window shop with the cast member's pins without committing to a trade, just be sure to be courteous of the cast member's personal bubble while you browse. Also, you're technically only allowed to do two trades per lanyard or board, so if there are multiple pins you're wanting to trade with a certain cast member, narrow it down to your top two picks and move it right along to your next lanyard or board. Finally, don't forget that while cast members are required to trade with you, other guests are not. So even if you see a guest sporting a pin you've been looking for for ages, you can ask politely about it. It, but brace yourself because the answer could be no if the guest just wants to show off their collection but isn't looking to swap with anyone else. Disney's resort parking rules are super weird because, well, they're kind of finicky. Ever since the 2020 closures, Disney World has really cracked down on who's allowed to park in their resort parking lots. If you're initially searching for answers on the Disney World FAQ page, the wording can be misleading because according to the FAQ, complimentary standard self-parking is available for guests visiting Disney Resort hotels for the day to enjoy select dining, shopping, entertainment, and recreation experiences. But that's not the whole truth. 
Sure, those who are visiting Disney World resorts but not staying at them can technically visit these hotels. But when it comes to parking at them, you're really going to need to have an advanced dining reservation lined up at said hotel or have a room there. Otherwise, there's a good chance you're going to be turned away. Even if you do have an advanced dining reservation for one of the resorts, you're not going to be allowed to park at them all day long. You're only allowed to park there for up to three hours to prevent non-resort guests from taking up too many parking spaces from folks who've actually paid to be there. And the same thing goes for resort guests visiting a hotel they haven't booked a room for. For instance, if you're staying at Disney's Beach Club but you're trying to visit Grand Floridian, you'll need an advanced dining reservation already lined up at Grand Flow if you want to park there yourself. And even then, the parking for non-resort guests at Grand Floridian can be a doozy because you might be directed over to the cast member parking lot, which is still quite a trek from the resort itself. In short, resort parking can be very confusing, which is why taking Disney's complimentary transportation to the hotels from the parks or the Disney Springs area might be a better route for you to just avoid the confusion. That way you can visit the hotels without worrying about needing an advanced dining reservation in the first place. Just remember, bus transportation doesn't travel between resorts. So if you're trying to take a Disney bus from, say, Port Orleans French Quarter to Coronado Springs, you're going to have to first take one over to the parks or to Disney Springs and then transfer to the correct bus from there. See? Told you these rules were pretty bizarre. Also extremely useful. Be sure to check out the other bizarre rules videos on our DFB page next and stay tuned for more Disney World tips and tricks to come. Thanks for listening, everyone, and thanks for watching. As always, this is AJ for Disney Food Vlog, and we'll see you real soon.